This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I do want to welcome each and every one of you who have come today. All right, I would like to read two passages of scripture with you today. First of all, from the gospel, Matthew chapter 10. We're going to pick it up in verse 24 and read through verse 33. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone acknowledges me before men. I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. And now I want to read to you from the book of Acts, chapter 20. And we're going to read verse 17 through 38. And uh, this is kind of the story of a farewell. We're going to hear the story, and then we're going to draw some lessons from it. Now from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. <laughs> how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and affliction await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the work of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I covet no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all, they embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful, most of all, because of the word that he had spoken, that he would not, they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. This is the word of the Lord. 
Somebody gave me a birthday card one time. Had a picture of three old guys on the front. And the first one said, <clears throat> it's windy today. And the second one said, no, oh, it's Thursday. And the third one said, me too, let's go for a drink. <laughs> they tell me that the hair is the first thing to go, the hearing is the second thing, and the memory is the third thing. Two old guys were talking, and the one fellow said, last night, my wife and I went out to the restaurant, and I had the best meal I've ever had in my whole life. And his friend said, well, what was the name of the restaurant? And he said, oh, man. Oh, um, um, mmm, oh, boy. Um, what do you call that plant that has the big red flowers and uh, thorns on the stems? And his friend said, uh, you mean a rose? Yeah, rose, that's it. Uh, rose, honey, what was the name of that restaurant we went to last night? <laughs> Oh, man, it's, it's kind of tough getting used to being the same age as old people. Um, this, this is the last time that I will stand on this platform as your pastor. Um, and so my message today is going to be a little bit different, I guess. It's, it's going to be kind of a personal word. I'm, I'm going to draw from the scripture, but I just, want to, I just want to say some things to you personally as the DCC family. It's okay if other people see this. It's nothing, nothing secret or something we wouldn't want them to hear. It's just that, well, you guys are special and I'd like to leave you with some personal thoughts, I guess. We've been here for seven years. Some people say that seven is the perfect number. There's been a lot of water under the bridge during that seven years. Uh, during these seven years, um, we've seen all kinds of things happen. We've, we've seen some, some births, some babies have been born. And, you know, we've got people in the church today that were hardly a twinkle in dad's eye back when, okay? We've seen... Uh, Kids who were in elementary school graduate from high school. We've seen people get married. We've had a number of deaths in our church family. Um, people who graduated to glory. And, uh, you know, we, we'll see them again, won't we? I, I think about a lot of the things that we've shared, community events, barbecues, fishing trips, and uh, motorcycle Sundays as recently as last week. And we had something like 140 people with the kids and 50 motorcycles out front. And that's, of course, a highlight for, for many of us, especially those of us who ride. Many of you were not here seven years ago when we first came. And uh, now you are, and you're a part of this family, and we value you. And I can't imagine not having you as close friends. There have been uh, facility upgrades over this period of time. Uh, some of you will remember when we first dreamed about putting in an elevator so that we could assist people with uh, mobility issues and getting down to the fellowship hall downstairs. And that seemed like an almost impossible dream. But with God, nothing is impossible. And now we take it for granted that on Sunday mornings, those in need can get on the elevator and go down and come back up again and, you know, it reminds us all that life has its ups and downs. <laughs> We've had a repaint of the whole interior of the church. We've done an exterior renovation completely all the way around the building. Um, we put in all new doors and windows and, and window coverings. Do you remember the day we first had these window coverings in place? And uh, I pointed them out to everybody. And, and then stood up here and I said, you know, how do, they, how do they go up and down? And I said, around here we operate by faith. And, and you know, I, 
kind of went like this, and, <laughs> and up they went. And, Okay, you know, that, that's good. Uh, now, uh, yeah, perfect, all right. That's, you know, that, and, and some of the kids are sat there with the great big bug eyes. And, and uh, yeah, it, you know, I can remember Logan being completely bamboozled. No. <laughs> and... Uh, and we've got that beautiful landscaping down out there. It was uh, so professionally uh, designed and professionally carried out. And it's beautiful now. I, you know, I, I got to say it, it really has fulfilled a, a personal dream of mine to, to make this premises into the most beautiful place in Delisle. And I, I really think it is, um, especially when all of you are here. Uh, that's, that's big. And you know, we, uh, just within the last few weeks, we got all the new floor coverings in throughout the upstairs, and you're all on it right now, appreciating that, and, uh, and air conditioning, which was a tremendous blessing last week when the place was packed and the temperature was hot. Uh, all those things are good. And even the pastor's study, the office, um, we got rid of those old bookshelves along the walls and had built in beautiful rustic hickory bookshelves right built into the wall and and the place has a window in it now and a window that opens and you know it's it's beautiful i hate to leave it but i'm so glad to be able to leave it for the next person who will come but those are all exterior things and we realize that this building is just an instrument and not a monument. It's here to better serve the church family and the community of which we are a part. So, at a really significant level, one of the things that gives me the most joy as I think back over these seven years is the 29 baptisms that we have been able to carry out during that seven years. Yeah. That's all the credit and all the glory for that goes to Jesus. It does. Those baptisms, well, we can't see hearts, can we? We can only look at the outward appearance. God looks at the hearts. But baptism from the earliest of church history has been understood as an outward act of faith and obedience that indicates an inner change of life which is accomplished by the work of the Holy Spirit. I love baptisms. And there's people here this morning that I had the privilege to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You affirmed your faith, and I want to encourage you to go on in your faith. We've, we've seen people come into the church, and we've seen people go too, but... It's been a growing together experience all along the way. In Acts chapter 20, we have an account of the Apostle Paul's farewell to the Ephesian church, and especially to the leaders. And there's just a few things, not to compare myself to Paul, because I would never dare to do that, but there's things that he had to say to them that I think pertain to our situation as well. And I'd just like to kind of share with you some of the things that I noticed. Um, first of all, in Acts 20, verse 18, we find Paul beginning by saying, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I got here. And I thought, yeah, over seven years, you people have got to know me pretty well. Really well, I would say, in many cases. And I hope that I have been able to live, although imperfectly, consistently. That I've been the same person when you've seen me here in church on Sunday morning, 
or you've seen me in the coffee shop on Wednesday, or you've seen me on my motorcycle with friends, or active in the community in some way. We should all seek, as followers of Jesus, to be living a lifestyle that's consistent. Being real. Being the same person. Not, not acting out being a certain way on Sunday morning and being something else completely during the week. We've sought to serve with humility and, yes, sometimes with tears. We've learned to weep with those who weep as well as to rejoice with those who rejoice. And then I, I love verse 20, Acts 20:20. 20, 20. I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. And that's, uh, that's been my hope, too, that I've been able to share with you anything that I sensed would be helpful to you. Yes, you too. <laughs> and uh, we've done that here in the church building each week. And I've been in many of your homes, and we've shared the things of the Lord. <laughs> hey, that is a great, yeah, oh, don't take them out. You don't have to take them out. <laughs> really, you don't. We don't mind. We love having them here. Yeah, every time he makes a noise, we'll just take that as an amen. Yeah. So I, I would pray that this would continue to be a church with 2020 vision. That is Acts 2020. A church that continues to share anything that would be helpful and profitable and that will teach both publicly and in our homes the things of the Lord. And then, says Paul, I was happy to share both to the Jews and to the Greeks. And I look at that and I think what he's really saying there is I was happy to share with the insiders and the outsiders. And uh, that's what we've tried to do too. We've tried to share a consistent message, the good news of Jesus, the story of his love with the people who are inside, but also the people who are outside in the community. We want everyone to know that Jesus loves them. You know, there was a famous German theologian by the name of Karl Barth. He wrote a lot of books. He was regarded as a real expert on theology. At the end of his life, they said to him, is there anything that, that you could say to kind of sum up all of uh, what you believe? And he said, yes, yes, he said, I could do that. He said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Isn't that great? And it's true. And it kind of sums up what it's all about. We have a consistent message, a message, as Paul said, of repentance toward God, that is, turning around, instead of going in the sinful direction, we turn around and go toward God, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus makes all the difference for life and for eternity. Paul said, I'm going away. He was headed for Jerusalem. Reno and I are headed for Tennessee. And we hope that we get treated better there than what Paul did when he got to Jerusalem. But just like Paul, we don't know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. Our future is in God's hands. And like the Apostle Paul says in verse 24, I, and Reno along with me, we want to finish the course and the ministry that God has given to us. See, I really believe that even though I'm not going to be a full-time pastor after Thursday, I think that's the 30th, I'm still going to be a minister of Jesus. And so are you. Every member of the church should be a minister. To be a minister means that you're one who is available to serve. And we should all be serving God. Somebody said, well, you're a full-time minister. Well, let me ask you a question. How many full-time ministers are there in this church? Hopefully all of them. Because if you're ser not serving God all the time, who are you serving the rest of the time? Right? So let's all determine to finish the course, 
to finish well, and to carry out the ministry that God has given to us. Paul said, I have a ministry to testify to the gospel. That is the good news of the grace of God. What is grace? Some people have defined it, or used a little acrostic to define it. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. It is unearned, unmerited favor. It's the favor that God pours out on us, not because we're so good, but because he's so good, and he loves us so much. Now, when Paul was taking his leave of these folks, he was pretty sure that he was not going to see his parishioners again in this life. And he told them that, in verse 25. I am pretty sure that I will see many, if not most of you again. We'd like to come back and visit, if you'd have us. And uh, there's always an open door for you to come and visit us in Tennessee. But it is entirely possible and perhaps inevitable that I may not see some of you again in this world. But here's the thing. If you have committed your life to God in faith in his son, Jesus Christ, we are guaranteed to see one another again. If not here, then there. And I guess I should also add this heartfelt warning. If I don't see you again in this world, and if you do not make your peace with God while you are here in this world, then this is goodbye. I don't want that to be the case with any of you. In verse 28 of Acts 20, Paul says, and especially to the leaders, but it applies to all of us, pay attention to yourselves. Don't get sloppy. Don't get off track. Don't take your eyes off Jesus. Make sure that you are in the word. Continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Pay attention to yourself. Don't let little sins creep in. Don't let bad habits start to take over. They have a way of getting out of control and ruining lives. Pay attention to yourselves. And pay attention to all the flock. When you see others struggling, when you see others hurting, when you see people going through tough times, come alongside. You do this well. Continue to do it well. Do it even better than you've ever done before. Watch and see. Look through the eyes of Jesus. See who really needs a helping hand, a kind word, a loving touch, a hug, a meal, clothing, groceries, whatever it is. Who needs an encouraging word? Who needs to hear an admonition from Scripture? Who needs to be told us, as my wife had to do in a very straightforward way recently with one of our grandsons, to straighten up and get your life back on track. You're going a bad way. And he didn't like it when he heard it, but he took it to heart and he apologized to some people and he talked to God and he received forgiveness and he's doing well again. And I'm, I'm glad that she cared enough to confront. For those of you who are in leadership, remember that the Holy Spirit has placed you in leadership. And he's done that so that you will care for the church of God. Never forget whose church it is. Jesus paid the price. He said, I will build my church, not your church. And the price he paid was his own blood, which he shed for us on that cross at Calvary. And then, in this passage, we find Paul sharing a warning. And I want to share that warning with you today. Why do I pass along this warning? 
Because what Paul warns about here is something that has been happening in churches all over the world ever since the time of Paul. And it can happen here too. And so I share the warning. And by the way, a warning is not a negative thing. The, the negative counterpart of a warning is a threat. And we're not here to threaten you, just to make you aware, to give you a warning. Paul writes that uh, fierce wolves will come, not sparing the flock. And that's, that's kind of a, a scary thought. These wolves can, can come from outside. They can come in a lot of forms. They may come in the form of a, of a government that is increasingly hostile towards Christians and the Christian faith. Government um, by what they permit or what they mandate uh, can, can cause challenges for the church. It can come in the forms of things that are taught within the educational system that are contrary to our faith and which seek to undermine the faith of our children and our youth. It can come in the forms of societal pressures. Now these things are, are out there and we need to be aware of them. You know, when they fly the, uh, the rainbow flag, instead of getting all uptight about it, do what I have chosen to do. I choose to remember that the rainbow is the sign of God's promise. And every time I see a rainbow flag, I think, there's the flag of God's promise. According to Genesis 9 and 16, God says, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature and all the flesh that is on the earth. It was a promise of mercy, a sign of God's mercy, that no matter how corrupt people became, how corrupt society became, that he was a merciful God. So there are those wolves that can come at us from outside. But understand this, the most dangerous wolves are the wolves in sheep's clothing. The wolves that come from within the flock. He says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. The greatest danger comes from within. Beware of those who seek to have people follow them rather than to follow Jesus. That's what we want, is to have people following Jesus. And it says, be alert. Be alert. It doesn't say be afraid. It doesn't say be worried. Worry is stewing without doing. It's not helpful and it's not healthy. Be alert. And watch. And all will be well. And then... In verse 32 of Acts chapter 20, we come to the little phrase that I took as the inspiration for the title of the message this morning. He says, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. I commend you to God. And that's the way I feel about all of you. You are commended to God. To commend you to God means to commit you to God, to put you in his hands. You know, being in God's hands is the, is the best place you could be, the best place that anybody could ever be. But to commend you to God means even more than that. It also means to represent you to God as worthy of his care and attention to recommend you to God, to ask that he would treat you with kindness and with favor. And that is my prayer to God for all of you. My DCC friends, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. His word, the scripture, the Bible, is able to build you up and give you an inheritance together with all those who are saints. You 
say, I don't feel much like a saint. If you've been forgiven by God, you are a saint. In fact, there's only two kinds of people in this world, the saints and the ain'ts, right? What a great group of saints we are when we have experienced God's forgiveness. The Bible says, be filled with the Spirit. That's talking about the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And the actual literal translation would be, be kept on being filled with the Spirit. It's a continuing process of living your life under the influence of God's Holy Spirit. Scripture says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. It's not saying that being filled with the Spirit is like being drunk with wine. It's contrasting it to being drunk. Living under God's Spirit is the way to go. It's the best way to live. And it happens when you are filled with the word of his grace. The Bible says that the word is the sword of the Spirit. When you read the Bible, when you study it, when you hear it being taught, when you hear it publicly read in church, you are giving the Holy Spirit of God material to work with in your life. So give a priority to the Word and insist on that. And then Paul just kind of wraps it up with some practical words of how he has demonstrated a lifestyle that is pleasing to God. And he says, don't covet. Don't be jealous of what others have. Work hard. Help those who are weak, those who are struggling. And then it says, when he got to the end of his message, he prayed for them, and then they all exchanged hugs, and then they saw him off to the ship. I want to encourage you, as I commend you to God, to know what you believe and to believe what you know. And uh, I thought, it would be good this morning to affirm those things which are central to our faith and which have been affirmed and celebrated by believers and followers of Jesus down through the centuries. So um, do we have the Apostles' Creed? I think it would be great to just read or recite, if you know it by heart, the words of the Apostles' Creed together. It's a statement of what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. I commend you to God. Amen. Oh,